extended. Uh, today I'll be talking about the, the topic of fixing NPM vulnerabilities. And uh, before I start to do that, I'd like to ask how many of you have worked with some sort of a JavaScript package manager in the past? A raise of hands. Okay, so there's quite a few of you, right? Uh, for the rest of you, like these are a few JavaScript package managers. So there's NPM, there's YARN, and there's PNPM as well. For the rest of you who haven't worked with one such package manager in the past, uh, I would probably assume that you have come here from a, a, from a Kotlin or an Android background or a Flutter background. So you can think of these package managers as, Kot, uh, as Maven or Gradle if you are coming in from a Kotlin background. Or you can think of this as Pub if you are coming in from a Flutter background. So throughout the talk, I'll be trying to make parallels uh, between these three worlds just so that it's easier to understand for the rest of you as well, right? And so now that that's clear, let's start with the talk. So hello everyone, my name is Siddharth Ajmera and uh, I work as a front-end developer for, uh, for the Westpac group. And I'm also a Google developer expert in Angular and I also work as a freelance web developer and mentor on the side. So just in case you need any help with any of your Angular, React, uh, Node.js or JavaScript code in general, please feel free to reach out to me. Also, uh, before we go ahead, how many of you here watch cricket? Okay, a handful of you, okay. So that's great because I also uh, play for the Indian international cricket team. <laughs> I'm a right-handed batsman there. So just in case you need an autograph, you can reach out to me at the end of the talk. All right, now let's get to the serious stuff. So uh, before we go ahead fixing NPM vulnerabilities, we'd like to ask, why exactly is it important and why should I care about it, right? So I come from an organization where security is of the utmost importance. And whenever we have to release code to production, uh, there's this code security scan that goes, the, that, that my code goes through. And then uh, if that security scan fails, then I'm not really allowed to publish my code to production, right? And if you are coming in from a similar organization, where security and compliance is of the utmost importance. Say, if you are working on uh, banking or financial services domain or in uh, an e-commerce domain, then there's a high chance that you would be following a similar process here, right? And if you are not coming in from one such background, then there is a high chance that in the near future, you might work at one such organization, right? So this information comes in really handy if you know about it, right? So that's why, uh, Fixing NPM vulnerabilities is one such step that you can take in order to uh, make sure that your code is a bit more secure, right? All right. So, um, okay, let's go back. Before we start to do that, right, let's start to understand what are some of the jargons that are related to these package managers and in the JavaScript world especially, right? So there's a file there that has a list of all the configuration related to your project. So things like the name, the version, the author name, licensing, and uh, all these scripts and other uh, things related to your project. And uh, if you have come from a JavaScript background, then you might be aware of what file it is that I'm talking about. Can someone tell me what that file is? Anyone? Yeah, so it's the package.json file, right? So as you can see, this is what the package.json file looks like. So uh, as I said, it has things like name, version, scripts, which can basically be things like what exactly should your code do when you run a specific command like npm install or npm start or things like that. And then uh, there are these two important things which are dependency specific, which is the dev dependencies and the dependencies object. So the dependencies object and the dev dependencies object look something like this, wherein we have the name of the dependency on the left and on the right, we have the version of that particular dependency. So the, depend the, the version of this dependency follow a specific naming convention and that's called the semantic, uh, semantic uh, versioning system, right? So any version with respect to semantic versioning consists of three parts. One is the major version, the minor version, and the patch version. So as you can see here, three is the major version, nine is the minor version, and two is the patch version. Now the major version would generally consist of breaking changes. 
So say things like uh, new implementation or background level API related changes. If there is some code that was deprecated in one of the previous versions, that code might not be, uh, that, that, that code might completely be removed from this particular version. And that's why if you install this particular version, then it might break your ecosystem, right? So that's what the major version is. The minor version is something that a developer would release if they have like say, uh, some backwards compatible code, or if they have some uh, code refactoring that they have done to make it more optimal, right? And things like that. Then there's a patch version that you would generally uh, release if there are some bug fixes in there, right? So this is what the semantic versioning looks like. So as I said, if there is a, if there is a version, then it would be something dot something dot something where there is major dot minor dot patch, right? So again, when it comes to NPM, there's this package.json file, which tells us uh, what all dependencies are packaged or our code generally depends on. And if you're coming in from a Kotlin background, you can think of this as build.gradle file. If you're coming in from a Flutter background, you can think of this as your pubspec.yaml file. The next thing is your node modules folder. So the node modules folder is the folder where all your third party JavaScript library dependencies get installed, right? And again, if you're coming in from a Flutter background, you can think of this as dot Flutter underscore plugins folder. If you are coming in from a, a Kotlin background or an Android background, you can think of this as the libs folder. And then there is one more important file, which is your package hyphen log dot JSON file. If you are coming in from, uh, and an, like if you are using NPM as your uh, package manager, if you are using yarn, then it would be your yarn dot log file. Now again, just to draw some parallels here, this is your gradle dot log file if you're coming in from an Android background, or it can be your pubspec.log file if you're coming in from a Flutter background. Now, what exactly is this package-log.json file, right? So if we go back to our package.json file, you would notice that there are a lot of these dependencies listed with versions in there, and some of these versions have a, a caret symbol before the actual version name, and some of them also has a tilde symbol, right? So Angular Forms has that caret symbol and RxJS has that tilde symbol. Now what exactly do these symbols really mean, right? So if we go back to our semantic versioning cheat sheet, then you can think of the caret symbol as something that if that is specified and if you run npm install, right, then it will try to install the latest minor version and the patch version, keeping the major version intact, right? And if there is a tilde symbol specified in that particular version, then it will try to install the latest patch version, keeping the major version and the minor version intact. So that's basically the difference between the caret symbol and the tilde symbol, right? Now, uh, quick question. Can two different versions exhibit different behaviors? It, they can, right? Because if let's say there, there was a bug in the version 3.9.2 and that bug was uh, fixed in a patch version and a new release was uh, released, so say that new release was 3.9.3, .3, right? So the version 3.9.2 and 3.9.3 .3 can exhibit different behaviors, right? Because in the first version, there would be that bug. In the second version, there won't be that bug, right? So yeah. Uh, if there are two different versions, then it can exhibit two different behaviors, right? Now, let's say uh, there is a scenario wherein I, as a developer, created on, like, worked on creating the setup for this project, and there was a developer who joined my team, say, 10 months later, right? Now, if they try to install all the dependencies 10 months later, then there's a high chance that they would install a different version of a specific dependency as compared to me, right? Because in the, in, the, in the coming 10 months, there might be a new release for that particular package, right? So in order to fix that, what happened was uh, NPM introduced the package-log.json file. Now what this file does is it locks in the version of a particular package, right? So what this would, uh, now this is something that came in with npm uh, 5.x, right? And this act, this particular file acts as a single source of truth when it comes to installing dependencies, right? So uh, 
if I today install specific versions of certain dependencies, then we can be sure that as long as this package hyphen lock file is pushed to the version control, the new developer who comes into the team 10 months later and when they run npm install, as long as they also have access to this package hyphen log.json file, and why won't they be uh, able to access it, right? Because it is uh, pushed to my version control, right? So when they install uh, all the dependencies, we will, like, it will make sure that the versions of dependencies that are installed on my machine are the same as the version that they will be installing, right? And so this is again something that should be committed to the source control. And this is why the package hyphen log file is quite important. Now, we work in an, in an ecosystem today wherein there is a third party JavaScript library for basically everything, right? From say, uh, some uh, component library which implement the material design language to say, uh, a package for implementing authentication and authorization, right? So there's no need for us to implement something from scratch now because of these third-party JavaScript libraries, obviously. But uh, while they are present, is it necessary that they are all secure? Probably not, right? And if they are not secure, then there's a high chance that if you are using these libraries in your project, then your project is not secure as well, right? So that's why we need to look ahead uh, and fix these NPM vulnerabilities. Now, generally what happens is, there are a lot of uh, companies out there who maintain some sort of a database for advisories. So generally what happens is, whenever there is a particular uh, vulnerability on a specific package, a security advisory is, uh, is released against that particular package, right? And this is what a security advisory looks like. So what this does is it tells you what specific package has that, depend, uh, has that vulnerability, it tells you what are what all are the affected versions that has that particular uh, that has that particular uh, vulnerability in there then it also tells you that if there is a patch version possible so if there is a patch version then you can probably install that version and then that particular vulnerability will go away right it also tells you the severity of this vulnerability specifying how important it is for you to uh, fix this vulnerability right so how exactly do we leverage all this information uh, and try to understand what all vulnerabilities do our project have, right? So that's where the audit command comes into the picture. So audit command is something that is available as a part of, uh, of these third-party JavaScript libraries, right? So you can run the audit command and what it does is that it sends a list of dependencies that you have in your project to a registry and then it tries to calculate if there are any vulnerabilities in your project. And if there are any vulnerabilities, then it also tells you and calculates uh, resolutions that you can do in order to fix those vulnerabilities. So, now this is something that was only available as a part of NPM 6 or later. So you'll need NPM 6 or later in order to use it. And then uh, if, you're, if there are any vulnerabilities that are found, then an impact is calculated and you can then run further commands in order to fix those vulnerabilities. And then the way it does that is using this meta vulnerability calculator that you can check out uh, after the talk, right? And uh, now there are some vulnerab uh, vulnerabilities that can be fixed automatically, right? So whenever you run NPM audit, this is the sort of output that you would get. So it would list all the different packages in your project that has a particular vulnerability. It also tells you the specific versions that has that vulnerability, the severity level, and there is a link to that advisory as well. So you can click on this link to uh, know more about what exactly this vulnerability is all about. And then it also tells you if there is a specific fix available for it. So here it says that, say, uh, Webpack, uh, there is a vulnerability there and the severity is high. This vulnerability impacts version 5.0.0 till 5.75.0 and uh, there is a link to that particular advisory as well. And then there would also be some sort of a remediation for it. So now that we know how we can identify if there is a vulnerability in our project, how exactly do we fix it? So there is also an npm fix command. Now before that, 
Uh, I showed a screenshot before that had the, where we were using NPM. If you are using Yarn instead, which is again another third party, uh, uh, another uh, JavaScript package manager, then you can uh, run Yarn audit, and then that gives you a similar sort of output. Now, how do we fix it? So there's a fix command as well, just like npm audit. So you can just run npm audit fix. So uh, initially you can see that there are there were like four vulnerabilities in there. Two were moderate and two are high. And whenever when when you would run npm audit fix, it would try to fix as much vulnerabilities as it can on its own, right? So after it ran uh, npm audit fix, you can now see that there are just two high security vulnerabilities that uh, that are present, and the rest were fixed by it automatically, right? Now, uh, generally, most of the in, in most of the cases, it tries to fix these vulnerabilities for you. But then there are some times that you then you'll also have to manually intervene in order to fix those vulnerabilities. So what exactly can we do in order to fix those vulnerabilities manually, right? So the very first step is to follow the advisory that it uh, that it suggests, right? So whenever you click on the link that it shows the advisory for, you can uh, see information related to a specific version that has a fix for this vulnerability. So you can then identify that this is the version that you can use in order to fix the vulnerability, right? And then the other thing that you'll have to notice is if that particular package is something that you directly have in your package.json file. So say if you are uh, running Angular, right? If you, are, if you have an Angular project and there is a dependency on Webpack, right? Because Angular CLI internally uses Webpack and there is a vulnerability in Webpack, then there's a high chance that you won't be seeing that particular uh, listing in your package.json file. And so you'll also have to check your package-log.json file. Now when you check your package-log.json file, uh, you can try to see if there is a specific version listed in there where the major version is the same and the minor and the patch version are different, right? So if that is the case, then what you can do is that you can update the version for that particular library by applying either an override or a resolution, right? So when it comes to applying overrides, what you do is that you um, first try to identify what specific patch version is listed in the advisory, and then you create an overrides object in your package.json file. And then once you have done that, you can just run npm update, and then it will try to update the installation in of that particular package to the uh, version that was listed in the advisory. So, say the, the same example that I told you about, which is Webpack. Uh, now, the advisory says that the, 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 the current version of Webpack that we are using is probably having some sort of a vulnerability. And in order to fix it, we'll have to install 5.76.0. So, we, we, can, we can say that Webpack is something that you won't find in dependencies or dev dependencies objects. So you'll have to check for that in your package-log.json file. And uh, once you have made sure that all the different versions listed for Webpack in your package-log.json file has five as the major version, while keeping the minor or the, major, minor or the patch versions different, you can make sure that you can specify the, the version as 5.76.0. And then you can just override this particular by running npm update. And then that would update the version of Webpack to 5.76.0. Uh, 5 right? The other option that you can do is, you, instead of the overrides object, you can use a resolutions object. Now, resolutions object is something which is very specific to YAN and uh, not NPM. So in order to run this particular thing with NPM, what you'll have to do is that you'll have to create a resolutions object and once you have created the resolutions object in your package.json specifying the name of the dependency and the version, then you'll have to use uh, another third party JavaScript library in order to uh, apply this particular resolution. And the name of this library is npm force resolutions, right? 
So the way it would work is you can specify the resolutions in your package.json file and then you create another script which is the resolve script and then here I'm just like running npm force resolutions using npx just so that I don't have to install it and then when you run npm run resolve then it would make sure that all these specific uh, versions of those resolutions are applied on your package-log.json file. So uh, now I'm afraid that I won't be able to show all of this in action to you because I cannot uh, really connect my machine. But this is something that can be done. And just in case you are interested in understanding how exactly it works, uh, please feel free to reach out to me after this talk and then we can go through that whole process again, just in case you are interested, right? Now, uh, there is some bonus as well, right? So there are a few um, bots that work in order to do this manually, uh, sorry, in, in order to do, do this automatically so that you don't have to go through this whole process again and again, right? So there's a bot called Dependabot by GitHub, right? What it does is that whenever there is a security advisory that is released against any specific package, if you are using that particular package in your uh, project, then it would automatically create a pull request and uh, try to update that particular package for you, right? So you can just merge this particular pull request and then uh, ma make sure that you don't have that vulnerability anymore. And similar to Dependabot, there's also another bot called Snikebot, right? And that's a similar bot, does a similar kind of thing. And similar to the GitHub um, vulnerability database that we saw earlier, there's also a Snyke vulnerability database. And as you can see here on the left, not just for NPM, it does the same thing for all these other uh, third party library managers as well, right? And then they would probably follow a similar process, I would assume, right? So you can do something similar if you are coming in from a Flutter or an Android background. And uh, Snyke also has a CLI. So just like NPM, you can do uh, something similar with the Snyke CLI as well. So you can run Snyke test in order to check uh, whether your project has any vulnerabilities. And then you can run Snyke fix in order to fix those vulnerabilities. And yeah, that's pretty much it from my end. That's the uh, link or the QR code to the slides. So in case you are interested in downloading it and watching it later, you can do that. And uh, does anybody have any questions now? Uh, hi, Siddharth. Hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, while talking about vulnerabilities and security issues, could you give us like some real life example you faced in your work? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I was working on a calculator for the Westpac group earlier, right? And uh, we were using a lot of different libraries uh, with respect to React, right? And as I said, every single time we have to release a new, uh, a new feature to production, we are supposed to uh, make sure that we don't, our code doesn't have any vulnerability in there, right? So every single time we would try to push the code there's a code scan process that happens, right? And that code scan process uh, gives you a go ahead if your code doesn't have any vulnerabilities. If it does have any vulnerabilities, then you won't get that go ahead and you won't be able to release your code. So that's, that's something like this whole idea of the talk came in from that particular experience that until and unless you go through that code scan process, you won't be allowed to uh, merge your code or you know publish it to production. Now this is something that, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are a lot of companies that might not really be worrying too much about it. But if you are working especially in banking or financial services or e-commerce domain, security is very important there. And so even a very small bug or even a small little vulnerability in your code can expose the whole uh, company to vulnerabilities or you know attacks. So it's, it's quite important there. Uh, does that answer your question? Not really, okay. Once you use some third party packages, like yeah. how it can inject uh, vulnerabilities to your code, like what kind of vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities yeah, security issues? So that, 
would probably be and uh, be a question to a uh, to a security expert, which I'm not really. But uh, I think if you want to know more about this particular um, question, then let's see where that particular slide is. So, um, if you open up this page, let me try to do that if I can. Um, does this not connect to internet? <laughs> okay, uh, any, uh, anyways, so the whole idea is that you'll, you'll get all that sort of information in this particular page, right? So it tells you what exactly is the impact of this particular vulnerability in your code. So, I guess if you're interested in understanding what exactly is the impact, then you would be able to get a lot of information on this particular page. But I, as a developer, generally, uh, generally only care about the patch version because that way I don't have any vulnerabilities in my project. So yeah, does that answer now? Sweet, all right. Hello, um, I'm Lorenzo. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Um, done a lot of NPM vulnerability fixes during my position. Um, a really big dilemma that comes to mind whenever I fix vulnerabilities within a JavaScript ecosystem like my company is, um, you said at the start that third-party libraries have different databases for vulnerabilities. So these third-party libraries would have different algorithms to fix these vulnerabilities because the vulnerabilities inside each database would be different, and I'm guessing the resolution fixes within each database would be different. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting that you bring up SNCC because SNCC is actually the example that I've found um, which have these conflicts in algorithms. So it's like, oh, maybe library foo in the NPM registry makes you um, resolve the vulnerability by incrementing to 0 0.0.1, 0 .1, but then SNCC um, forces you to go 1.0.0. Um, yeah, this is a dilemma because we know that NPM is like, it's the core re repository for JS um, dependencies, whereas maybe SNCC, um, maybe there's a business requirement where, okay, SNCC is the um, basis of what we have to fix towards. So what is your opinion on how to resolve those conflicts between the databases, and would you go towards business requirements or NPM requirements? I think it would completely depend on the business requirements, right? Because if your business requires you to adhere to uh, SNCC side of things, and they consider SNCC database, vulnerability database as a single source of truth, then I think you, you would probably follow SNCC's version, and that's when you can use SNCC as the tool in order to fix those vulnerabilities. If your company instead uh, you know, uh, prefers GitHub, uh, then you would go with the NPM route, I'd say. Then I guess a follow-up question. If you go exclusively with SNCC resolutions, how do you come up with the confidence that the method you ignored from NPM wouldn't hurt you in the future? question uh, so I think if like wh when it comes to that hurting me in the future what it, it would mean is that there is still a vulnerability out there that hasn't been fixed right and so there's a very high chance that the developer of this particular library uh, probably already knows about it since there is an advisory released against that particular vulnerability 
So um, I think if, if they are actively maintaining that particular third-party JavaScript library, then they would still have to fix it just in order to comply with, uh, with the requirements, I guess. Okay. Um, and yeah, I also have another question. Um, yeah, I guess just as a general kind of question, I just want to know others' opinions. Um, so if you go back to the diagram where it shows the differences between the major, minor, and patch versions. Yeah, so it says in major, um, breaking change, um, and it says patch and minor bug fixes, backwards compatible. Yep. Um, what's your opinion on refactoring code from a major, like what's your opinion on trying to look deep into what code needs to be fixed from a version upgrade um, between minor and patch fixes because my general rule is that if there's a major change, that's the only time it would like my internal code would re require a big refactor because it's a breaking change, but with minor and patch upgrades, it's my kind of mindset is like, okay, I don't really need to refactor a lot. Would you have a similar opinion or do you have a certain thought process with the different um, kinds of version changes? Yeah, so I guess I'd, I'd be very careful when it comes to changing the major version, right? And it's, it's probably easier to just stick with the minor version and the patch version. Uh, so I guess as long as uh, I upgrade to a particular version that doesn't really break the ecosystem, uh, and since I'm already pushing this whole uh, package hyphen log file after I have fixed all those vulnerabilities to my version control, and the whole team is basically sitting on the same code base. I don't really think that should be a problem. But yeah, again, like if if there is a major version change, then that's that's definitely going to break the ecosystem. And so there's a lot of work that would be involved in fixing that thing. So yeah, I guess I would stick with just the minor and the patch version changes. And uh, until and unless there's a very uh, very strict requirement around that major uh, that major version change. I wouldn't really touch that until and unless there's a, there's a lot of requirement around it. So with minor and patch upgrades, you wouldn't really, your approach isn't to refactor too much with those. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And again, like, see that that completely depends on the uh, on the scale of your project as well. If it is a very big, large project that also impacts other teams, then I don't really think it makes sense to go ahead that whole rabbit hole of fixing the major version. So I think yeah, that's the easiest approach that we can. Go ahead with, yeah. Thanks for the talk, Sid. It was uh, really interesting. I just wanted to ask uh, a question around clarifying the difference between um, the resolutions and the overrides. Yeah. Um, and when would you, oh, well, I don't know what they, I, I, like you explained what they do, but I don't know what when I would pick which one. Um, yeah, so just trying to get some clarity on that. So I think, uh, like I'm, I'm not even sure about what exactly is the exact difference between overrides and resolutions. The only thing that I know is that both of them are pretty much similar when it comes to upgrade, up, upgrading your versions. And uh, if if you don't really want to use another third-party JavaScript library, uh, then you can probably just go ahead with the overrides version. I even barred this particular question <laughs> regarding the difference between the two, and I wasn't really. Uh, convinced with the answer that I received as well. So I'm not even completely sure what exactly the difference is, to be honest. Fair enough. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Siddharth. Hi. Uh, thank, thank you for your presentation. So I wanted to ask you that, uh, have you ever tried like fixing the audits and vulnerability, uh, vulnerabilities automatically? And did it cause you to like, break some features that you already have in your app? Um, so as far as I recall, like most of the vulnerabilities got fixed. Like, uh, so so this, this Westpac group example that I was giving you, uh, there were like, say, uh, 130 vulnerabilities out there. When I used to run NPM audit fix, it would probably uh, fix about 100 of those vulnerabilities, and 30 would still require manual intervention in there. And so um, <clears throat> I would just probably make sure that 
uh, whenever I'm doing that manual intervention, I specifically follow the suggestions that are provided in the security advisory. And uh, again, like there are like when when I was fixing those vulnerabilities, uh, there were generally multiple different versions in the fix or the patch version as well, and not just one specific one. Right, so I would pick the one which was closest to the version of the package that I was using, based on my package-log.json file. So, uh, say if the if there is a uh, if there is a security vulnerability on 3.9.2, just just for uh, uh, an example's sake, and uh, there were two patch versions in this. One was 3.11.14, and one was 5.0.0. Right, and I can make sure that the package uh, version that I'm using uh, has three as the major version. So I'd probably pick that three point, uh, say ten point fourteen or fifteen, whatever that was, right? And I won't pick the one which was five point something point something because that would be a major version change, and then again and that would yeah, be that exist. that requires refactoring. Yeah. Yep. 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 So. Thanks, Sita, for your talk. Um, just a question on, like, I know, like, security vulnerabilities in your project can be, like, sort of lots of different severity. Um, would you only look for, like, the critical severity um, vulnerabilities, or would you, like, consider other severity vulnerabilities to fix? Uh, so it completely depends on the requirement of the business, right? Um, in our line of business, it's ideally recommended to fix all the vulnerabilities out there, even though there are low or cr uh, low critical, doesn't really matter. Uh, we need to fix all of those. So yeah, <laughs> that's, the, that's the approach. Mm -hmm.